Hey, following on from doing the dark and moody photographs, this week we're looking at light and airy and almost high key images. Now, as you can probably imagine, this is pretty much the opposite protocol. So rather than trying to remove the light and hide the light, bring all the dark props in, this time we're trying to add the light, bring the bright props in, bring the bright backgrounds in and make everything have the same aesthetic. So with all of these things, you can only go so far with the technique. If you have a dark and moody background, some dark props, taking a light and airy photograph of them isn't really going to work. So it all has to be consistent. Sorry, some, something just flew across my face then. Either that, I'm starting to see things. So before we go any further, we're going to talk first about the fundamentals of lighting and how to actually achieve this, and then we'll go into taking the shot. So looking back at the inverse square law, if we want to have an evenly lit image, we know that the light has to be reasonably far away from the subject. This way we end up in the two to 3% ratio of fall off rather than right at the front where we're losing 75% of the light within the first small bit of space. But there's another way to go about this. We can also add a reflector to bounce the light back in. Now it gets mathematically complicated then, but generally I do it by eye. So I pop something in and if it bounces enough light, we're good. If it's too much light, we bring it further back closer in if there's not enough bounce. And that's basically the gist of it. So we're going to need to have light and airy props, a light and airy subject. We're going to want a light source which is gonna evenly fill the scene. And whether that's by having it a long way off or very close is entirely up to us. And then perhaps a reflector if the light is coming in from close to avoid that deep, heavy shadow. Now there's four main qualities of light. There is specular and diffuse, and then hard and soft, sort of, ends of the spectrum. I am filming this here on a reasonably small light source, but it's diffused. It's got all these like frosted front panels. Behind me, this guy, he is big, so he's gonna be soft light, but it's got a specular crisp inside. So it's gonna be specular, crisp and soft. And you can combine these in all different ways. Now, one of the reasons that massive diffusers like this and the one that I'm about to pull in exist is because if you have a light far away from a subject, it becomes harder light because the light source relative to the subject is smaller. One second. This little light here, if I'm lighting my finger from this distance, will be a soft light because it's really big. If I bring it miles away, yes, it doesn't actually reach anymore, but it'll be a hard light. So these massive soft boxes are designed so you can have them a long way off and still have some form of, some form? Some form of soft light. Let's turn this back off. So you don't have to have these massive diffusers. There's a limit as to how big a diffuser can be and still soften the light when you're in a confined space. I'm going to use a massive soft box, but only because it's already set up. I'm not using it for any other reason than that. I'd use a smaller one, but I can't be bothered to either get a light out, get the soft box, whatever it may be. I'm gonna go with what I've got. Don't feel that you need a softbox of these biblical proportions. There's also a mistake purchase. I misread inches and centimeters. Let's dive into the shot. I'm gonna get set up with Capture One. I'm shooting on a Canon 5DS and a 100 millimeter macro lens. That equipment there has no bearing on how we're going to achieve the shot. Any camera, any lens, it's all about the lighting and the styling. So here we go. It's not an interesting shot. I happen to have some garlic kicking around. So we've gone for a bluey gray background, which on a side note, I do sell these, which is a shameless plug I know, but gotta eat. And we've just placed the garlic on there. I've gone from a huge light source from the left and a reflector coming in from the right. You'll just notice down here, we've got a bit of shadow. We could get rid of that completely but then it just looks like garlic floating in the air. Now what I've just done, I've just moved the light back by two meters. I'm gonna take a shot and we'll find it underexposed. There we go. Now, because I've got such a massive softbox, what I'm going to do is open up the lens to 2.2. I'm gonna keep moving the light back until it's just really almost quite flat lighting. So quite a way to go. Okay, so I've doubled it again. I'm going a little bit further back still. And you'll see that if we go from here, where the shadow is quite pronounced, the shadow is really opening up at this stage. Yes, it's blown out to pieces, but you get the gist. There we go. It's slightly older the adjustments I've made. 
double check it's in focus because we're at a very small aperture. I think I just want to change that focus point a little bit. I want it to sit more here on the edge of the first garlic clove. There we go. That's now got the garlic clove in focus, which is much better. I've got the nice texture there. Now I've used a very small reflector and a massive. So there we go. Now what I'm going to do quickly is jump back to open the same catalog up to my pumpkin photo, the dark and moody one. Now you see how the shadows are really deep and really strong. They go completely to black down here. And if we contrast that to this image here where the shadows are open, they're still there. I'm not a fan of completely shadowless work because we're trying to create a 3D image and if you get rid of the shadows, you've just got something stuck onto paper. But we've really changed the feel. It's the same one light setup. The only difference is rather than blocking the light and absorbing it through black fabrics, we're trying to get it across there. Also with the dark and moody shot, we brought the light really close in. So shadows would be very deep, very sudden, very dramatic. This time we've moved the light a long way back so we get an even lighting over the scene. We've gone for very monochromatic tones. We've kept the color palette very simple. Whereas when we go back to the dark image, we've got the reds and the greens, and the dark browns and blacks all sort of really adding to the aesthetic. So what we'll have to do now, I'm just gonna do a quick crop into a four by five aspect ratio because it's my favorite aspect ratio. There we go. And there we have it, some nice garlic. It's not a perfect shot, it's not particularly interesting, but hopefully it shows the technique behind it. So that's it in a nutshell. It's nothing too complicated. All we're really looking to do is create an even consistent light and to avoid too he heavy a shadow from the lighting. Apart from that, it's down to prop choice, subject matter, and the background you shoot them on. You're not going to get a light and airy shot shooting on a dark wooden background with some plums. Just not going to happen. Now, all of this is basically the fundamentals of lighting. It's all to do with the inverse square law. I use this for pretty much all of my shooting. It's always something which is in the back of my mind. Now, I don't go around going, well, yes, at 3.5 meters, we're going to lose X percentage of light. I don't do all of that in my head, but I'm aware of it. And I think that's the main thing, just understanding that the fall off of light from 100% instantly goes down to 25% and then eventually gets smaller and smaller in terms of how much we're losing considering the distance we're creating. It's something that you really need to get your head around to understand photography. I'm going to do a load of different lighting videos showing how we interpret it and utilize it in different scenarios. If you're enjoying these videos, do hit subscribe, do share them with your friends. I'm still putting out weekly content and I'll see you guys all next time.